All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started tonight. Um, I realize this is Labor Day weekend, and you'll see if you can see the Zoom screen that uh, I'm the only one on. I'm alone tonight, but that's okay. I know a lot of people are on the road and a lot of people traveling this weekend, but I do wanted to just have this time where we can dig into the Word together. Uh, and as you watch this on YouTube and you join uh, virtually later on, um, I hope this, this is a blessing to you. And this will be the one of the last times that we'll do it here in a Zoom format. Uh, this, this Monday, next week, I'll do it as a Zoom uh, meeting like this. Um, and then the following after that, it'll be a, a pre-recorded lesson that I'll put up on YouTube. Um, I'll record it on Monday, and then I'll put it up on the YouTube channel, share it on the Facebook page. Uh, by Tuesday um, so that you can just follow along that way, but we won't have the Zoom format starting that week of the 14th of September next week. All of our stuff is starting back up again. So our home groups are starting back up. Our lady study is back up and running again. Our men's study is happening every two weeks. And so I don't want folks to feel like they've got too many things and too many things to compete with their family time and too many things that they would want to be involved in which is why I'm switching this to a YouTube format uh, after next week's lesson. So tonight, uh, you, as you jump into the YouTube um, video and you follow along, I hope tonight as we dig into the Word of God that, that the Spirit really speaks to you tonight and, and teaches you and equips us better uh, to be better followers of His. Now tonight, we're continuing in our short little series we've been doing the last couple of times called What Does the Bible Say About? And this has been sort of a Q&A kind of series where you tell me questions and then I will spend a little bit of time digging into the Word of God to see what it has to say. And so tonight, I want us to ask the question, what does the Bible say about the rapture, one of the end times, end times events? When we talked about, you know, we're going to keep this going in the Zoom format, we talked about which book of the Bible might we, what might we dig into, might we study? Several of you perked up considerably at, at the idea of us teaching through the book of the Revelation. And end times events always fascinate us. We have this, this fascination with how are things going to, to play out? How are things going to, and when, do, when are these things going to take place? We're always fascinated by the end times events. I saw something on Facebook. This was a couple of years ago. Somebody shared this on Facebook, and it was a meme that floated around, kind of went viral a little bit for a while. Um, and this guy said this. The title of it was, The Bible says the world is going to end on June 24th, 2018. Now, he's not the first guy that has made that kind of claim that they knew exactly when the, when the end times were going to come and but this guy made this very bold claim. The Bible says the world's going to end on this particular date. And this is how he came up with it. And he said that if you add the number of crop harvests um, along with the prices. Hey, Jeffrey Wright, glad to see you popped on tonight. I went ahead and just started. You and I are the only two so far, but I went ahead and just started. I'm, we're talking about um, the question we're answering tonight is, what does the Bible say about the rapture? And I was just sharing um, this meme that floated around on Facebook. And this guy made this claim a couple years ago, that the Bible says the world's going to end on June 24th, 2018. This is how we came up with it. He said, if you add the number of crop harvests along with the prices, and then you add in the number 666, and factor in the 42 months of the Antichrist's reign, and when you put all of those things together in some, um, I imagine, complicated mathematical formula, it results in the 24th of June of 2018. Well, you can imagine on the 25th of June of 2018, this guy looks very foolish. But I think that every generation, probably since the first century, has thought that their generation was the end. They look at things that are happening in the world. They look at the events that are taking place. They read Jesus's description in Matthew 24, where he talks about some of those end times events. And they look around, and, and I think every generation has probably thought, this is it. 
You know, you can imagine in the 1940s uh, when World War II was going on and God's people, the Jews, were being herded off and, and by the thousands and the millions were being slaughtered, that there were probably a very high degree of people that were looking around saying, this has got to be it. This has got to be the end times. In our world, in such a turmoil right now, we talked a little bit yesterday about how the, our culture really, in, in a lot of ways, is coming apart at the seams. And, you know, with our world in such a turmoil right now, it makes us think about those end times events that much more. And so I think it's important for us to think a little bit about one of those key end times events, and that is this, this event that we call the rapture. And so the, the specific, specific question we're looking at tonight is, when will it take place? When will the rapture of the church happen? Not when in time. I'm not looking for a date like this guy came up with, but what is the order? I mean, that's really kind of the question when it comes to the rapture. Not will it take place or not what does it look like, but what's the order of events? When we look at the end time, where in the end times will this take place? And so to start answering that question, and by the way, this is a question that has been hotly debated in theological circles for the last 2,000 years. And so I'm not so um, built up that I would think that we're going to, to deal with the answer, deal with this question and answer it 100% absolutely satisfactorily tonight in the one hour we have together. But for us to start digging into it and start answering the question, open up your Bibles if you got it, First Thessalonians chapter 4. We just started a sermon series yesterday, Sunday mornings. We're going through uh, 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be there tonight, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is not the only place in Scripture where we see uh, perhaps a reference to the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15 may, in fact, be talking about it. Um, John chapter 4 may be talking about it. But this is certainly in 1 Thessalonians 4 is the clearest teaching, the clearest place that talks about what we refer to as the rapture. And so you follow along verses 13 through 18. Those are the verses in question. And this is what Paul had to say to the church there in Thessalonica. He said, but we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you do not grieve as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and, re and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, so let's pray together before we jump into the lesson tonight. Father, we thank you that we once again can come to you and open up your word and be challenged by it. And Father, I pray tonight as, as we talk about this issue, these end times events, this rapture, Father, I just pray that your spirit would speak to us. Help us to understand it. Help us understand not so much the, the particulars about it, but the importance of it, the significance of it, why it matters to us. And so, Father, as you teach us tonight, would you help us to hear you? Would you help us to respond to what it is that you have to say? And we, and we just pray for your blessing in our time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jeff, are you connected with us tonight? I see your name up on the screen, but I want to make sure you're... you're uh, yeah. Are yeah, you? I'm here. All right, excellent. Well, man, it's just the two of us, so if you've got questions or comments, feel free to chime in along the way. Um, I'm certain this is an issue that if you haven't gotten to in your seminary studies and your systematic theology textbook, you'll get to it eventually, but um, certainly chime in if you've got questions or comments. Um, here's how I want to approach this, this question tonight. As we look at the end times events, I want us to look at what's going to happen. What are some of the big muscle movements? We're not going to dig through every one of them and, and pick them apart and look in great detail, but I do, I do want to talk about the, the big muscle movements, what will happen in those end times. 
how will it happen? Um, we'll talk a little bit about the timing of some of those events and what I believe is the timing of this event of the rapture, but, but I will also look at some of the other viewpoints. I don't want to just gloss over those, but we want to mention those as well. And then I want to spend some time before we're done tonight and really talk a little bit about why it matters. Why does it matter these events that will happen in the end times? Are these just things that, that theologians and seminary students talk about in, in their classrooms, but they're not really things that matter to us as normal everyday Christians? Why does it matter that we talk about this? Why does it matter that we know about this? And so we'll spend some time talking about that. First of all, what is going to happen? What are some of the end time events uh, that will take place? What are the key markers, the key things that are going to make up how God will end the times as we know them, these times that we are in right now, and then he'll usher in his final piece of his redemptive plan. What are those major muscle movements? So the first thing to mention is what we're talking about tonight, this issue called the rapture. And that's really what, what this passage here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is talking about. One of the things he's talking about there is this thing called the rapture. Now, you may have noticed, um, as, we, as I read that just a few minutes ago, that the word rapture doesn't appear there. And you know, it's, it's a concept like the Trinity. The, the word Trinity doesn't ever appear in scripture, but the concept is very much there. And, and the, the word rapture, certainly not in the original language, not in English, doesn't appear in this passage. But we get it from the, really the Latin translation when this was, when the scripture was translated into Latin, the word there in verse 17 is translated caught up. In English. The Latin word for caught up is the word rapturo, and that's where we get this idea. That's why we call this the rapture, and what really is happening here, the word in the original language <clears throat> is translated caught up. It means to snatch or to take away something by force, and it's the same word that, that is used in John chapter 10 of, of a wolf snatching the sheep, or later in John chapter 10, Jesus talks about where no one will be able to snatch us as believers out of the Father's hand. And it's the same word. It means to snatch and take away by force, a very sudden removal of something. And so this, this rapture, this thing we're talking about, is that time where Christ is going to come back. This is what Paul is talking about here. Christ is going to come and he's going to snatch up his church, a very quick sudden removal of his church. Second thing, that's one of the things talked about in the end times events. The second major piece of the end times events is what is known as a time of the tribulation. That's a, a designation that Jesus gave it. In Matthew chapter 24, he's talking about it. He describes this time and it's going to be a time of, we think there's, there's turmoil in the world right now. There's upheaval around the world right now. This will be an unprecedented time. This is how Jesus describes it in Matthew chapter 24, verse, uh, starting with verse 7. He said that nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. And he says in verse 9, that they will deliver you to a tribulation. That's where we get the, for the title for this time. They'll kill you. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. So this, this time of the tribulation, it's a period that will be seven years long. And, and we, we, we get that from a prophecy of Daniel, back in Daniel chapter Nine verses 24 to 27. He says there that there will be there will be 70 sets of seven year periods until God closes this age of sin, this age that we live until God closes this down. And the way Daniel describes it there in Daniel chapter nine, he says that the Messiah will be killed after 69 of those days. He says seven and 62. But the Messiah will be killed after 69 of those sets of 
seven years. And so that leaves one of them left. One of them left unfinished, unfulfilled. And that's this period then that is the tribulation. Daniel says that in verse 27, he says there will be, this is where we'll kick it off. There will be a, a covenant with many nations that will appear to kind of solve the Middle East problem. You know, every, you know, every so, so many years, a politician comes along and they're going to try to solve the problem and bring peace to the Middle East. And over and over and over again, it's been tried and tried and tried. Nothing ever takes. And one day that's going to be solved. And this will, will kind of kick off this, this period of this, these seven years of the tribulation. And this will kind of restart the, the ticking clock of that last seven-year period that Daniel left out there. The 69 of them already been fulfilled, that last seventh of them. Halfway through that, three and a half years in, a powerful world leader, the Antichrist, will rise to power. And Paul, over in his second letter to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, he calls this guy the man of lawlessness. So this one will rise to power, this one that will become great prominence and, and more and more and more become a, a figure of world dominance. And Revelation chapter 13 tells us that this guy will reign for 42 months. So if you do the math on a calendar, 42 months, three and a half years, he will reign during the last half of it. Now, Jesus talking about that period of the tribulation um, there in Matthew chapter 24, if you read down to verse 21, he kind of gives this second half, this second three and a half years, an additional designation. And he says there in verse 21, he said, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. And so the last period, those last three and a half years, we, we talk about, we refer to it as the great tribulation, that, that time of suffering that Jesus talked about that will be to sort of mark all of the tribulation, that will get worse in the second half. So we have the, the rapture, there's the time of the tribulation, then there's the second coming of Christ. Now, whether this is a separate event from what Paul's talking about here in 1 Thessalonians 4, or it's the same event. We're going to talk about that here in just a few minutes. But the fact of Jesus's return, his second coming, is really one of the most widely taught topics in Scripture. Twelve of the new the books of the New Testament reference it, and it's and there's numerous ref, references in the Old Testament to the Day of the Lord. And so it's a topic that is talked about a lot in Scripture, the second coming of Jesus. There in Matthew 24, as Jesus is talking about these end times events, talking about the tribulation, talking about those times, he says that when he comes again, that will put an end to it. That will, that will mark the end of this time, these seven years of tribulation. And then you read in the Revelation, Revelation 16, also over in chapter 19, it tells us then that there will be a final decisive battle where Jesus utterly defeats the forces of Satan, the battle in a place called Armageddon, Armageddon. So these, so far these three building blocks, and then the last piece is the millennial and thousand year reign of Christ. Revelation chapter 20 talks about this, tells us that Satan, his minions will be chained up, they'll be cast into the pit of hell, chained up, for a thousand years. And during that time, Christ and his church will reign on the earth, and then Satan will be unleashed again. Now he'll wreak his havoc as he does, and then there'll be a final judgment at the great white throne, and then Christ will set up a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, so there now if you're a puzzle builder, I'm not a I'm not a big puzzle guy, but Jeannie likes to do puzzles. My mom as I was growing up, she was a big puzzle builder. And, you know, if you're a puzzle builder, the, the first thing you do is you lay out all the pieces. And that can seem like it's a little bit of a tedious task to put them all out there and flip them all over and kind of survey what you've got. But if you're a puzzle builder, that's what you do. You've got to sort of see where all the pieces are before you try to assemble them 
in a picture that makes any sense. And so that's what, we, what I've just done is try to lay out what some of these pieces look like. And of course, this is not everything. I'm not going into great detail, although it took us, what, 20 minutes or so to go through that, 15 minutes to go through that piece, but that's not in great detail, these end times events. If you wanna read some more detail about it, go into the book of the Revelation, uh, chapters six, six through 21. Go through some of these events in very great detail, some of the things that are going to take place. But these are the big muscle movements. So at this point, Jeff, let me ask you questions, comments. You think I missed anything? No, I, I think um, you kind of laid, you know, a lot of uh, converging themes out. Um, I think it's important to note that the day of the Lord is often thought of as a sequential, but an immediate thing. Um, and it's very difficult to unpack that in an event order and understand it all as one as well. So, um, just for me, that helps me to remember the day of the Lord is kind of like a unfolding of the second coming, you know? So yeah. it's, um, it's a lot of, um, interesting topics going in at once yeah yeah and and there's a, and there's a lot of you know individual references here and there and so yeah so it's a you know it's important to kind of keep all of these things in you know in the context of what how they were originally given um but yeah you know when, when you look at the the topic of the second coming um there's a lot of references to it in some form or fashion throughout scripture um okay so we talked about the the big muscle movements what's going to happen all right let's talk for a minute because this is the question we we are trying to answer tonight or trying to at least talk about tonight how will it happen now of course we're talking about the timing of some of these events now is that you know i think it's important first thing for us to say is that the bible simply doesn't give us an exact laid out timeline it doesn't tell us enough information to form any dug-in dogmatic position i've heard some people say you probably have to and talk about these issues when you're very passionate about what we believe about our particular um, opinion or interpretation of how the end times events are going to play out and i heard a guy one time say if you don't believe in this particular position about when the rapture will occur, then you don't believe in the inerrancy of scripture. And, and I, I stood there just absolutely incredulous to hear the comment. I thought, well, the, the, the fact of the matter is the Bible doesn't give us enough information to get that dogmatic about it and say, this is the way it absolutely has to be. But I do think we can form, we will, we've formed opinions about them, and I do think it's important for us to have some conversations and be able to have a dialogue about them. And the timing of this event in 1 Thessalonians 4, the time of this event, the rapture, um, is what is debated, you know, is what is debated the most, the timing of it. When is it going to happen in, in relation to the period of the tribulation? And there are two main camps, although there is a third camp that we'll mention here in just a minute, but there are two main camps. And that is either the, the rapture will be before the tribulation, the pre-trib, you may have heard it referred to that way, or it will be after the tribulation, post-trib. There is a third position, mid-trib or pre-rap, sometimes it's referred to as that. It's not, not as many people hold that position, but there is that third position to say that the rapture would occur halfway through at the three and a half year point before the great uh, tribulation takes place. So let me unpack them just a little bit, talk about them, and then I'll, I'll tell you where I fall on the issue and why I fall there. First of all, the pre-trib position, the, the basic understanding of it, the rapture, and the second coming, I talked about those just a moment ago when I said whether they're the same event or they're separate events, we would talk about here. In the pre-trib position, the rapture, the second coming are two separate events. They're not the same thing. And, and the, the main point here, I think, of the pre-trib position in my mind is 
that since all of the purposes of the tribulation, God's wrath on sin, God's defeat of sin, that those purposes have already been fulfilled by Christ in the lives of believers. So there's no reason for the church to go through the tribulation. So that's kind of one of the main points, that, that, that God would rapture the church out before the tribulation because it serves no purpose for the church to be there during that time of intense suffering. That's the pre-trib position. This mid-trib position, or the, the pre-wrath position, like the pre-trib, the rapture and the second coming are two separate events. They're not the same thing. They're two separate events. But in this viewpoint, the church remains on earth as witnesses for the first three and a half years. We go through the, the period of the regular tribulation, if I could call it that, as opposed to the great. The church is taken up three and a half years in, right as this Antichrist really rises to power. The church is taken up at that point just before the great tribulation starts. And the, and the reason where, where people see this where, where they get this, this notion that this is the way it's going to happen. One of the places they see it is over in the Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. There is this large group of people that are standing before the throne of God. And we're told there in Revelation chapter 7 that they are those who have come out of the great tribulation. And the question there is, who are these people? And, and it's a huge group. In fact, chapter 7, verse 9 says that no one can count them. It's this enormous group of people, tribulation saints, that are standing there before the throne of God. And, and, the, and the question is, who are these people? Could there possibly be that many unbelievers saved during the tribulation? So the idea is this, this has got to be all believers of all times. And so... The, the thought is that they would have been then raptured, came out of the Great Tribulation. They were taken out of it, taken out before it began. And so they see this, the tribulation is happening midway through uh, the period, or the rapture happening midway through the period of the tribulation. And then the last one is the post-trib position, that the, that the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation. Basically, the rapture, the second coming, are one and the same event. And when Jesus talks in, in Matthew 24 about his coming, that will end the time of the tribulation. In this position, that is the time the church will be raptured. They're one event. They, they happen at the same time. Matthew 24 is where they, th this idea comes from. In Matthew 24, it seems to indicate that believers will go through. Or some believers will go through the tribulation. And, and in fact, those who hold to this viewpoint, they, they, they point to the fact that the Bible talks about trials a lot and that believers will have to go through trials, but it doesn't promise that we'll be taken out of them. It does promise we'll be sustained through them, that God will walk with us through them, but it doesn't promise that we'll be removed from them. And so those are kind of the three big camps, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Jeff, let me ask you, did I, did I miss any key points there you think I ought to bring up or anything else that you wanted to add to that discussion? Yeah, I, it's interesting because if you read the Gospels, especially the Synoptics, um, it seems like there's this mini tribulation where Jesus is directly telling the apostles in Matthew 24 in the early parts that, hey, you're going to be delivered up. And he's speaking directly to them until um, it seems like it moves into a deeper tribulation period after the abomina abomination of desolation or, um, you know, whatever that means <laughs> in relation to Daniel chapter nine. So there's this idea that half of Matthew is dedicated to the destruction of uh, Jerusalem. And that's what pushes, you know, most of the Christians and the church out into the world um you know during this period of tribulation that's directly in jerusalem um and then the other half is talking about the greater tribulation um such as the day of the lord approaching so and that's where he ends matthew chapter 24 and a little bit of 25 talking about the return of the lord so it's it's easy to get mixed up 
uh, which scenario, what's he talking about it, but it's important to remember that prophecy has uh, a couple applications, especially the word revelation is apocalyptic in nature. It means to reveal. So um, understanding the difference between all of these converging points is really uh, interesting. And I think we can get twisted up if we don't contextualize um, time periods of, of what Jesus is talking about versus what John is talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right. And the, and the thing of it is, is that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of pieces and parts that, you know, we talk about some of the timing of the end times events. Um, we've got to piece it together a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, you know, Jesus is talking about suffering and he's talking about the tribulation. And so, it's, it's, you know, we, when we pull that out of there, um, which pieces are talking about what? Um, so there's a lot of that that goes on as we sort of piece some of this together. And that's why it really is the other thing that's important for us to keep in mind is, you know, we can have our opinions and we can have a, this is my best guess about how these things are going to take place. But we simply don't have, an, don't have any, enough in scripture to say, I'm going to dig in. This is the way it's got to be. That statement that I heard that guy make, that if you don't believe in a pre-trib position, that's what he said, if you don't believe in a pre-trib position, you don't believe in the inerrancy of scripture. And we, we simply can't make that kind of statement. We can't, simply can't be that dogmatic. And we have to approach this a lot more humbly and say, I have an opinion. This is where I fall in this matter, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong about this. Right. Uh, so I guess I let me lay a question out. Okay. Um, the beginning of the book of Thessalonians, you know, first Thessalonians one uh, verse 10 talks about um, how we're supposed to wait for his son from heaven, um, whom God raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Right. And then he starts speaking about this idea of Jesus saving us through the wrath. And then we get to chapter four and he says, hey, here's here's the salvation you don't be ignorant um don't have sorrow this is everybody who died in christ is going to rise again and this is how it's going to happen and then he peels into chapter five and says hey i don't need to tell you guys again um uh because you guys know perfectly the day of the lord comes this way yeah. right and it says the purpose of 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 this is the hope for salvation that right. God has not appointed us to wrath, mm -hmm. um, but to obtain salvation. So it seems like in, in this particular passage only, if we were only to isolate um, the rapture in this frame of work, that it would be easy to take the position that we won't suffer any type of tribulation or wrath based mm -hmm. on this book alone. What are your thoughts concerning that position based on this is one of the main texts that we pull out this idea of the rapture? You mean, what are my thoughts on, you know, will, will we be taken out before this takes place or? I'll make sure I'm answering the right question here. Right, right. No, yeah, I guess I'm just interested in, in your actual position. Not that I even have one uh, because I, I don't, you know, to be fair, like what is, what is tribulation? Because if it's tribulation, according to what Jesus talks about in Matthew 24, where he delivers us up to councils and they, you know, behead us for his namesake. Hey, that's been happening over, right. over and over and over again. So it's not, not yet the day of the Lord or is the day of the Lord a time period, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. just interesting. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, I think we can, we can look at tribulation as a general sense of suffering and trials, um, and as opposed to when we talk about the tribulation, we're talking about that seven-year period. So yeah, there's always tribulations that are going on. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. There will be there will be tribulations that as believers we will go through. Um, but yeah, where do I fall on the question? Let me let me tell you where I fall on the question. Um, but before I do that, let me just kind of put this, this disclaimer out there for you, Jeff, or anyone else that's, that's watching us on YouTube. Uh, I, don't, I don't presume to know definitively what the answer is here. Uh, I have an opinion, and I think it's an informed, I think it's a biblical opinion, but I have also read what I would consider very biblical 
uh, well laid out arguments that absolutely disagree with my position on this. And so I don't judge your commitment to Christ based on your opinion on this matter. Um, I don't judge your trust of scripture based on your opinion of this matter, um, just based strictly on your interpretation of this event. So let me tell you where I fall my best guess of how these things are going to take place. Um, I do fall into the pre-trib camp. So this idea that we are, we are not, um, you know, for, as believers, we are not to go through wrath, that particular period of wrath. Um, I do fall in the pre-trib camp. Um, you can see there are compelling, I believe, biblical arguments for the other beliefs, for post-trib or even for a mid-trib pre-wrath position. But I think that pre-trib fits fits the scriptural context better. Um, and, and so let me just kind of walk through that for a minute. First of all, and I think this rules out the mid-trib position, that we would go through the first three and a half years, but then we would be taken out right before the, the great tribulation. Um, and that is the purpose of the tribulation, the purpose of that time. The purposes of the tribulation, we've seen the revelation, in the revelation this progression of God's wrath being poured out on sin and poured out on the world. But for those who are believers in Christ, our sins have already been forgiven. Ephesians 1 tells us that. God remembers our sins no more. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12 tells us that. For believers, our sins have been washed as white as snow. That's what Isaiah said. We're justified in Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And so if, if the, the purpose of the time of the tribulation is God pouring out his wrath on sin, his wrath on sinners, we have to say that then the, the purpose of the tribulation doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't, it doesn't serve any purpose for the church to go through it. Our sins have already been forgiven. And we have to ask how the purpose of the tribulation are fulfilled by God unleashing his judgment on people he already declared not guilty. He already declared justified in his sight. And so for me, to make the church endure even just a part of it, the first three and a half years, the, the pre wrath position, to make the church endure even just a part of it seems to run counter to what scripture tells us about God's judgment with respect to believers and with respect to the sin in our lives. So that's why, so that's why I, you know, I think that rules out the mid-trib position. The second though, and this is the, reason, the other reason I believe in the pre-trib, and I think this rules out the post-trib position, is that these, the two events, the rapture and the second coming, are described in ways that really make them seem like they're different events. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it, we, we get the indication that Jesus stops in midair, and we meet him there in the air. He brings his church to him. But over in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 14, he's talking about the second coming, and he talks about Jesus descending all the way to the earth. In fact, he stands on the Mount of Olives, and he splits it in two. He comes all the way to the earth. And so the, we either meet him in the air, he comes halfway, or comes all the way. They seem like they're two separate events. The second coming is to judge the ungodly, to, to establish the kingdom. There's no judgment here that's talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with this event that he's talking about. So again, they seem like they're two separate things. The second coming, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, even what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, will bring sorrow to those who see it. But what did Paul say here in verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians 4? He said, comfort one another with these words. Talking about this event here in 1 Thessalonians 4, he said, this is a word of comfort. But Jesus said the second coming that would bring sorrow in the Revelation. It says that John says it as well in the Revelation. The, the rapture almost seems to happen in a, in a secretive way. If we see what, what uh, Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24, is talking about the, 
the rapture, he says, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. And those left behind seem to be unaware of what has, ha what has taken place. This, these things that, he, that Paul describes here in 1 Thessalonians 4, the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet blast, those, those people that are in the field are doing their thing, they seem to be unaware of any of that. The second coming, on the other hand, the way that's described there in Revelation chapter 1, every eye will see him on that day. There, nobody's going to miss that. Nobody's going to say, oh my goodness, there's Jesus in the sky. I didn't realize he was there. Nobody's going to miss it. And so again, they seem to be like they're two separate events. And I think that rules out the post-trib camp. Because in order to have a post-trib position, you have to say the rapture and the second coming are the same event. And then I, and, and I think really, I think this rules out everything but the tree pre-trib position is last thought, and that is what Jesus said about the timing. What he said about the timing of when these events are going to happen, Matthew 24, 36, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. If we were raptured mid-trib, we certainly would have an idea of when these things are going to take place. We would see that peace in the Middle East that will come, and that's something nobody's going to miss. It's going to be such a big deal. Everybody's going to see it, and we could say, okay, that would start this period of tribulation. Now we see the things starting to happen. We can count three and a half years from that. We would seem to know when it's going to happen. If it were a post-trib situation where the, the rapture happens at the end, again, when we saw that happen, we would just say, let's count seven years, and we know when it's going to take place. And he said, no one. And, and some would, would look at that, and the argument is he's only talking about those who don't acknowledge him. Those are the ones that won't know the day or the time or the hour. But the, but the way Jesus says it there in Matthew 24, he includes the angels and himself in that group of people who don't know when this is going to take place. So he's not just talking about people who have rejected him. And so I think as we, as we look at it, and we look at the, the positions, I believe in the pre-trib position because it's the one that seems to fit the data the best. It's how things, I believe, fit together the best. Christ will come in the air, rapture his church. That will kick off the seven years of tribulation. Jesus' second coming at the end will end the tribulation. And we'll have, then the battle of Armageddon will happen thousand-year reign of Christ, and after that, the final judgment. And so that's the way I think things are going to happen. Again, I wouldn't follow my sword over any of this, um, and I won't, you know, I won't dig in dogmatically and say this is the way it must be, but for me, the pre-trib position seems to fit all of the pieces the best. Okay, so Jeff, did that answer your question? I know that was a long answer to a very short question, but does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, I I also agree with you. I I think that the it's the clearest teaching. You know, not not getting into all the the different languages or the the many different trumpets that are blared throughout mm -hmm. the scriptures. You just kind of got to look at what's been given us in direct correlation with this event. And I think your point about uh, this is us meeting the Lord in the air. You know, the, the Lord's descent when he comes, he's coming all the way down. You know what I mean? He's not just, um, you know, going to hang out in the air. And the other part of that is um, if, if we were taken out, um, what, before? Is it before or after? No, after. Um, there'd be nobody to populate the millennium kingdom. <laughs> you know what I mean? There, it, it's an interesting um, facet, but this is such a complex issue, and I love your stance on it. It's filled with grace, and it allows for everyone to kind of be led by the Spirit um, in their own, you know, exegesis of the Scripture. Um, there's no reason why you have to give up the supremacy of the Scriptures uh, just because you believe pre or post or middle 
Um, but yeah, I totally agree with your um, your stance on it, though. I, as as far as clear reading of the text is understood, I think that pre is probably the best way to lean. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, Jeff. Yeah, and and I think this is you know this doesn't have to be a test of fellowship. This doesn't have to be something to say you've got to agree with me. You've got to see it just the way I see it in order for us to be friends, in order for us to be in fellowship with one another. It doesn't have to be that because this is one of those matters where we just simply don't have enough to know that. But I do want to spend our last couple of minutes and ask the question, why does it matter? Is this simply a topic, these issues of these end times events in, in general, and particularly this one, are these things that, that only matter to theologians, that only matter in the hallways of seminaries and, and normal Joes in the church don't really have to worry so much about this. Why does this matter? Why is it important? Because when we think about the significance of these events, our minds always track to the same question. When is it going to happen? What is the order of these things? But I think as we look at particularly this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, we have to take a step back and say, why did Paul write to the church in Thessalonica? He wasn't writing a theology textbook to them, although he does write a good deal of theology in it. But his purpose was not theological. His purpose was pastoral. He was writing them a letter, as we talked about on Sunday. He was writing them a letter of this, 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 these new believers of how to live as believers in Christ, how to be the church in a culture that doesn't love you, in a culture that doesn't accept you, in a culture that is hostile to you. And so he's writing a letter that's very pastoral. It's not a theological textbook. Not to say that it doesn't teach theology, but it's taught with, a pra with the practical in mind. In other words, what are we to do with this? And in the context of this pastoral letter, he writes about this, this event that we talk about, the rapture. And in fact, as, as I pointed out just a moment ago, Verse 18, after he's done talking about these things, he says, comfort one another with these words. It's a very pastoral approach he's got. And so the usefulness of this issue, any of the end times events, when the rapture one of them, but the usefulness of these issues doesn't require that we have precision on the timing. We don't have to know the exact order in order for these, these issues to be useful for our lives. And the first thing that I think is significant as far as why does this matter is the fact that we're not told the timing. And, and that, that drives us. I think that prompts us to have a certain amount of, of imminence. This could happen at any time. We simply don't know when this is going to take place. And so there has to be an imminence. There has to be a sense of urgency about our task to be disciples who are making disciples. We don't know when. It can come like a thief in the night. We need to be ready at all times. And the simple reminder that judgment will eventually come to everyone. That's one of the, one of the big takeaways out of the end time message at all, and out of all the things that we know about the end time. Judgment will come to everyone. And the simple reminder of that serves as a reminder to us that we need to do everything we can for ourselves and for others to be prepared for that day. And so I think when we look at the end times events and we say, why does it matter? Why are we talking about it? What, what difference does it make? I think one of the key takeaways is the fact that we don't know the timing and why that is significant to us. The second reason I think these are significant to us to know about these end times events is it gives us certainty that Jesus lives. That he is not some, he's not just, he's not in a tomb somewhere rotting away like every other religious leader. He is alive. He does live forevermore to make intercession for us. He will come again and get us just like he said he will. And we're told he was raised from the dead. He ascended bodily into heaven. He ever lived. He's making intercession. He's coming again. And those assure, all of these things in the end times assures us that those are true. And we get this sense of reassurance that the things that Jesus said will come to pass. 
The third thing I think is that we think about the end times and what's going to take place and, and us being taken up and that we will be with him forever. There, there is this promise of life after death that's not just philosophical. You know, it's not just this sort of pie in the sky out there, you know, ethereal idea. It's more than a philosophical speculation. It's a reality, life after death. Jesus said, John chapter 14, he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. And so there is this, this reminder, this reassurance, the promise of life after death, that as believers, we can go to be where he is and be with him forever. And then I think last is the promise and maybe we look around in today's day and age and we see our world seemingly falling apart and we see things happen and evil that just seems to get worse and worse every day. And we say, God, are you going to do something about this? I think as we look at the end times events, we get the promise that God will defeat evil and he will set things right. He won't do that necessarily in our timing. He won't do it in the way that we would want him to, but he will do it in his time, the right timing, the perfect timing. And it's hard, I think, sometimes for, for some people to see God as loving and powerful in the face of what they see around them and some of the evil that is happening in our world today. But we look at the end times events and we're reminded that God isn't surprised. That all of these things that are taking place, Paul said to Timothy, that things will go from bad to worse. And we're reminded that though that is happening, and though the, the world seems to be unraveling at times, that God is not surprised. God is not taken off guard. He's not knocked off his throne. He'll finish what he started. He'll carry it through. He'll defeat evil, and he'll set things right. So I think there are some significant takeaways, whether we can put the, the pieces all in place and say this is exactly how it will happen or not, we have some important aspects and important lessons and takeaways about why this matters, that we talk about the end times events, that, that God felt it was important enough to even tell us about them. They're important reminders for us, an important lesson for us, and just knowing about them. Okay, Jeff, any final thoughts, comments, questions, things that I didn't address that you would like, like me to about the very 50,000 foot look? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that it is important, um, as you said, to remember the practical application of, of this is um, that God is judge. You know, us who have obtained the grace to receive salvation by the Lord Jesus. Um, if you read all of chapter five, as I was doing, as I was kind of listening to you, all it is is encouragement to continue to do good and continue yeah. to work and continue to mend fences or help your weaker brother and, and not to just, um, you know, lose, lose your faith in the, in the midst of being at rest with God. It's, it's a command to continue to work because he's coming. Yeah. And he's going to find you in this, in this state that you end up in, um, you know, on that day. And, and it's, it's something people, you know, kind of, you know, joke about, you know, um, you know, you don't want to do that when the Lord's coming back or whatever, but um, it, it started off with them remembering the dead. So um, people probably were, were looking at their lives and their situations and saying, Oh, I, I should have, I could have done that, but now they're gone and they're mourning. It's a quick, it's a thing of mourning, but uh, going on to life. And if you're thinking about, Hey, I'm going to see this guy tomorrow when the Lord comes, you know, I'm going to get it right today type yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great observation. And, you know, you know, I think you know, the, the, um, encouragement there in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians to persevere in the face of persecution and the face of difficulty and suffering and things that are going on in this world persevere uh, because God has fulfilled every other promise that he has made and he's going to fulfill these up to the end 
every single one of them. He's not going to let us down. Um, we can be certain that in the end times, God will accomplish what he needs to accomplish. He will accomplish what he desires. Uh, and there'll be an urgency of the gospel. We're spurred on by that, an urgency of the gospel, an affirmation of Jesus' life, a promise of life everlasting, a confirmation of God as the righteous judge. And at the end of time, no one will be able to stand before God and say, you didn't do me right, God. You were unfair to me. You didn't tell me that this was coming. I had no idea of this wrath to come. No one will be able to stand before God and say that. And for the, for the believer, I mean, sometimes we, we you know, can think about the Revelation as a, as a scary book. But if, for the believer, it's not a scary time. The end times are not a scary thing. Or just a reminder, once again, Paul ends this passage talking about the rapture. He ends that passage telling them, comfort one another with these words. As you think about the end times events, when you think about how God's going to wrap it all up, let that be a source of comfort in who God is, rather than a source of discomfort in the pieces and the parts that we may not know uh, particularly. Well, thank you, Jeff, for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you in the YouTube audience for jumping on uh, and watching the video during the week. If you have questions about this, I know you probably have a thousand <laughs> questions about this. Um, but if you have some questions that you want me to elaborate on or, hey, you mentioned this, can you talk about this some more, um, email them to me, pastor at avianobaptist.church. Put them up on the Facebook page. Send me a Facebook messenger. Hit me up on WhatsApp. Um, I'll be glad to take your questions. And if you send them to me in one of those formats, I'll put the question up on Facebook so that everyone has both the question and the answer. Well, we're glad to have the opportunity tonight to dig into God's word. I hope you have a great week. I hope you, you experience the Lord's blessings this week and you just sense his presence and you're intentionally involved in being a disciple that makes disciples. So let me close the time in prayer tonight and then uh, let you get back to your family time. Father, once again, thank you for the opportunity to open your word, to be comforted and to be encouraged by these end times events. Lord, we know that you will keep your promises, you'll fulfill everything you need to fulfill, you will carry your plan of redemption on out to the end. You, the righteous judge, will decide how and when things will end, and you will prove yourself to be righteous once and for all in the end. Father, thank you for your promises. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for telling us these things and the assurances that they give to us. And Father, we do pray that we would be comforted by these words and just reminded of your goodness to us. Lord, as we go throughout this week, would you help us to be intentional about being your disciples, following after you, taking your name and your love to this lost and dying world? And would you help us to be intentional about doing that? Father, we thank you for the privilege of serving you and the privilege of being your hands and feet in this world. Bless us these days of this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, well, have a great night. Thank you for joining tonight, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Thanks, Pastor. Take care. All right, Jeff. Have a great night, man.